We have a great opening panel for you today. Many folks who are working on public policy issues in various types of organizations and capacities. We have lobbyists, we have executive directors, we have uh, staffers from legislative offices who are gonna talk to us about the work that they've been doing um, and work that you can be a part of. So I'm gonna step out and let them have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, so welcoming. I'm totally going off script right now because I just feel so good in this space. Let's just be honest. Um, but welcome to the Public Policy Roundtable um, for the 39th Annual Convening of the National Organization for Men Against Sexism. Um, I am Morgan Davis. I'm the executive director of the Chicago Area Fair Housing Alliance. And so we fight against discrimination within housing in the Chicago region. We publish a lot of reports. We do a lot of research. We advocate for residents. And um, we also provide technical assistance. And I'm joined today by a panel of experts um, in the fields of gender, sexual orientation, um, and race, and also within public policy as well. Um, I want to say that I find these topics especially interesting because um, the, perva the pervasive gaps between how institutions define gender and sexual orientation and race and how we as individuals and as people self-identify and how that plays out in our society. And so um, I think this is going to be a really great discussion today. Um, our first speaker is John Kolhep. And he is um, with the Illinois Unites for Marriage. And he is joined by Galon Alcaraz of Chicago Abortion Fund. We also have John Peller of the AIDS Foundation of Chicago and Audra Wilson, the District Chief of Staff for Congresswoman Robin Kelly. And so um, you can find each panelist's bio um, within your folder. I encourage each person to read through those because um, everyone's incredibly impressive on this panel today and have in some way greatly impacted um, the movement. So great. Um, the way this panel will go is that each panelist will speak for about 10 minutes um, on their advocacy work and shed light on some legislative issues that are happening right now. And then um, we'll also discuss why these things are important and why we should support them. Um, but we want it to be a dialogue, and so if you have questions or things to add to that, um, feel free to chime in at any time. So we'll start with John Kolhep. Um, can you start? And I don't know if I'm saying Cole Hepp, right? No, you are. Yes? I'm okay. pretty impressed. Oh, great, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you start off by discussing your work in marriage equality and um, possibly touch on some current events that are happening in the field? Okay. Uh, if I leave this on the table, um, can you hear me? You can use the other mic. Um, do I need to hold it up or can you, you hear me? Okay. okay. That's okay. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is John Kolhep, and uh, professionally, I'm a lobbyist with the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees, Council 31, which is based here in uh, Illinois, and we have about 100,000 members and retirees. For the last, oh, good Lord, 15 <laughs> years, I've been working uh, as a lobbyist or as a campaign manager for a variety of issues or uh, candidates. And for the last eight years, I've been with AFSCME. And there I advocate for public employees and public services. So the first thing I want to say about marriage equality is that, well, we won. <laughs> That's the first thing I want to say about marriage equality. <laughs> um, the, but I strongly believe in people power. It's why I work for a union, it's the household I grew up in, and that those who organize well can make demands on public officials and have those demands met. The second thing, people power can be expensive if your policy objectives require scale. And the marriage fight began behind the scenes. Um, as Tracy Bame's book points out, um, this was first an electoral fight where a group of donors got together to elect a number of pro-equality candidates um, and enhance the ability uh, to pass marriage equality in the House and the Senate. And then uh, my friends who supervised 
the lobbying effort, almost won marriage equality in May of 2013. Unfortunately, the opposition forces organized people to oppose the bill in the last month, causing representatives to get skittish. The marriage equality forces did not have the public base to push back, so the bill was postponed. That's uh, on May 31st, I was sitting on the side of the house, crying uh, with many of my friends uh, as Greg Harris got choked up on the floor. He was the sponsor of the bill. And many of you can see it on YouTube. It was a really emotional speech. And Greg, as my friend, I felt for him, but I also felt for the community of which I'm a part, uh, feeling a big loss. After that, the community was very angry, and its leaders were doing things like calling for Greg Harris's resignation and uh, calling for a new sponsor of the bill. And I think I talked with John, and I talked with other people who uh, are familiar with Springfield, and I said, I think I've got to put myself in this fight um, in a real way. And uh, eventually, I became the executive director of the campaign. And as Kim and others um, will talk about, or have talked about and have experienced, we didn't run this as an inside game. I mean, we had plenty of lobbyists, don't get me wrong, um, from plenty of organizations who worked on this. But the way we ran this was all about people power. And outside, there were, between July 15th and the 1st of November, there were 90,000 emails to 25 representatives. There were 70,000 phone calls to those representatives. There were 17,000 postcards delivered. We had organizers from Waukegan all the way down to uh, East St. Louis. We didn't let any single Republican or Democrat off the hook for voting against marriage. There were plenty of reasons why people uh, would have not wanted to call the bill in May, but we did not allow any single one of those reasons to impact our decision to call the bill in November. It was the community's call. It was the people's call. And it was those 90,000 emails, those 70,000 calls, those 17,000 postcards, and people working all over the state that forced that bill onto the floor and passed with 61 votes. It was a momentous time, but it could not have happened without people getting involved. And granted, that doesn't always happen on its own. We had lots of organizers all over the state. Damon Hainline was one of our deputy field directors. And uh, Karan Blair, who'll be here later, was our field director. Our organizers activated people all over the state, as I've said, especially in the suburbs. Those Republicans, we weren't going to let them alone, not ever. People would call me up and say, why are you in my Democratic district? You know, you're only targeting the Democrats. I was like, no, we got 20 Republicans. 20 Republicans whose districts were at 55% supportive, 67% supportive. Like, it, they came back with these polling numbers that we would just release to the media. Like, fine, if you're not going to, you know, support the issue, even though your constituents want you to, you know, you have to pay a price. And we made those Republicans pay a heavy price. We got on the phone and we called Republican primary voters who were in their districts, found Republican primary voters who were supportive of marriage equality, and had them go meet with the representatives. We didn't let them go in any way. And in the end, the 60th vote was a Republican. Uh, now granted, he did it for a lot of reasons one of which is he's now running statewide. Um, but we didn't let that district off the hook. Never. We were told, oh, he'll never do it, the lobbyists. He'll never do it. That, that vote will never get taken. Well, that vote was taken. 
and it was taken after we had Republican primary voters go see him, after we did 700 phone calls into his office, after he got a delivery of a massive stack of postcards from his district, he voted in favor of marriage equality. And that never would have happened had we, not, had we let up on that Republican. So it was all people power that did this. And what Kim has specifically talked to me about was to spend a few minutes just on how that worked and how it happened. And if you've got any questions about how it worked and how it happened, I'm prepared to answer them later uh, if I didn't answer anything now. But that's, that's the marriage equality fight. Thank you. Um, I really like that term you kept using, people power. I'm going to have to steal that. It's great. Um, <laughs> yeah. I see you wrote it down. Yeah, I did. <laughs> I like that. Um, <laughs> um, next, I was hoping to pass the mic over to Galen. Um, we were hoping that you could talk about your organization. Um, it's my understanding that you know extensive information about reproductive justice um, and also about sex education in schools. Yeah. I don't think I need this. Um, it's for the oh, for the camera. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so my name is Galen Alcaraz, and I am the executive director with the Chicago Abortion Fund. And it is almost 10 years that I've been at CAF uh, doing this work. I can't believe it. Um, and initially, when I came to Chicago Abortion Fund, it was a direct service organization, so providing funding for women seeking abortions in their second trimester. Uh, coming from a community organizing background, I knew, you know, the first year in that the women that we were serving needed to be involved <coughs> in a part of the discourse because the restrictive laws were impacting them the most. Um, so in 2007, we began to engage those women, uh, calling them back, inviting them down taking them through leadership development and training, and basically turning those women into peer-to-peer -peer educators in their communities. Um, they're all over the place, My Voice, My Choice Leadership Group. Um, we've made a pathway for them to come in and become leaders. Um, and currently, right now, our new deputy director is a former uh, member of that group who initially called our line for funding some years ago, um, Brittany Mostiller. And so the reason why I took that step um, some years ago was, you know, reproductive justice, it, it, the direct service piece is very much needed. Funding is very, very much needed. But that is not just it. Uh, women are coming to us because of a lot of different other things that are breaking down in their lives and in their families. And that all comes together through economics, through job, through housing, through health care. All these are different type of injustices that are impacting women and their decisions to make sound, healthy, reproductive decisions. And so reproductive justice is a combination of social justice and reproductive rights. That term was developed back in the 90s by some women of color in a white pro-choice conference. And they got together, they caucused, and determined that um, it wasn't just about abortion for women of color in marginalized um, communities. It was about so much more, um, the uh, totality of women's lives. And so that's how they came up with this. And they used the Human Rights Declaration as sort of this guiding framework um, to come up with this term. And understanding that and knowing that, uh, got together with the board and moved forward to change our organization into one that works from a reproductive justice framework. And so that is, you know, one of the things that we're doing. And we do a lot of advocacy, a, a lot of work around, um, you know, advocating for the rights of women, not just funding, but making sure that their voices are amplified and heard um, in the movement across many different movements, um, housing, economics, and so forth. And so one of the things that you, I think you were mentioning was the, the sex education. Um, that is um, 
something that Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health does a lot of work on, I sit on the board with them. So I'm not a staff person with them. They do a lot of work and they do a lot of policy around that. Um, but what I will say is that um, a couple of years ago, um, the Comprehensive Sex Education Bill passed here in Illinois. We worked really, really hard to get that um, passed, and it did pass. However, it is not um, as comprehensive as one would think. And so um, schools have the right to not um, use it, and you know, it, it's not really comprehensive. So um, we don't know how that really is working, but one of the things that we're working against is the parental notification. That passed um, last August. And it had been on the books and enjoined for years, um, but it had just never been enforced. And there was a you know, major you know, fight around that, and the Attorney General opened, reopened that up, and you know, now we have parental notification. And so that is something that we are working on um, to fight against. So we've been down to Springfield and talk to media. We've been doing a big postcard campaign with Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health because, uh, you know, even though we want to be involved with our kids' lives, I want to be involved with my, my kids' lives, but we also know that we can't regulate family dynamics. And so, you know, students, you know, teenagers need to be able to have as much information as possible, and they also be able, they should be able to make the best decisions for themselves. And so, when you know we have parental notification, not consent, because you don't have to have consent, but notification, you have to notify a parent or a guardian that you're going to have an abortion. That puts a teenager in a very difficult position. If she does not want to inform her guardian or her parent then she has to go for a judicial bypass. So she has to go in front of a judge and explain why she wants to have an abortion. And you can see how difficult and crazy that is. Um, the ACLU is doing a lot of work around that and they have a volunteer hotline um, to help teenagers navigate that process. But the bottom line is that if a teenager can carry a pregnancy to term and the government is not involved, she should be able to have terminate a pregnancy without the government being involved. So we're doing a lot of work around that. And if you want to be involved in that process, reach out to either um, ICA, Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health, or the ACLU um, for more information. There's plenty of information on both of those websites. And like I said, there, we have a postcard campaign going on and doing a lot of media and, and going down to Springfield and talking to our legislators about that. If you want more information on the Chicago Abortion Fund, we're all over the internet, we're all over social media, um, doing work around reproductive justice and advocacy work, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> So I actually have a follow-up question that I was thinking about while you were talking. Um, I don't know if the sex education uh, touches on this or um, if your organization touches on this, but um, is there any sort of, I guess, holistic competency that um, anyone is doing right now for young women? Because I feel like if you're a young woman in America and you're a high school student, um, there's a certain level of shame that many young ladies will have to participate in these types of groups and, and you know campaigns and things and so is there a dialogue out there among young women where you know you shouldn't be ashamed to advocate for this to be in supportive of this um, so that if there are people out there that know of young women to participate in this where could they go okay so one of the things one of our advocacy projects and we partner with ever thrive which is formerly illinois maternal and child health um, they do um, groups over at the high schools. And so for the past several years, we have been partnering with them at Roberson High School out in Inglewood. And we go and we do topics 
um, you know, not just about abortion, but you know, domestic domestic violence, um, images, women images in the media, and so forth. And, but we take plenty of information around um, sexuality and you know, helping um, the teenagers understand about birth control. So that's something that we're doing. We've been doing this for several years, but we go out and we speak to groups of women, um, you know, quite a few times a year. The other um, organization would be Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health. And so they do have groups. They have teenagers um, and very LGBT inclusive um, groups that go out to high schools, that do trainings, that do a lot of leadership and, and development and so forth. So those are some of them, Ever Thrive, you know, work specifically in high schools. Illinois Caucus for Adolescent Health works with teens. I don't know of too many other groups that, um, that do that, and we don't specifically have groups within the Chicago Abortion Fund for teenagers. Um, usually, um, when we're reaching out, we're getting girls that are between 18 and 26, um, is what our you know, normal range and average um, for you know, people calling us. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I was hoping to pass the mic over to John Peller. Um, you have an extensive background in AIDS prevention work. And so we were hoping that you can share your journey in that field and to talk with us about um, your organization and the work that you do. Great, thank you. Good morning, I'm John Peller, uh, Interim President CEO and AIDS Fund, uh, at AIDS Foundation of Chicago. Um, and Kim, thank you for having me and putting together this very fierce panel. Uh, and I wanna acknowledge a couple of our partners in the room, um, Howard Brown, uh, Lurie, somebody's here from Lurie, uh, and Trans Life Center. Um, I'm like having major love for Trans Life Center these days. We've been doing some really, really, really exciting work uh, with, um, with Owen at the Trans Life Center and Lambda Legal and ACLU on trans healthcare access. Um, and this is a total diversion. Uh, but uh, the Illinois Department of Insurance just released a bulletin uh, requiring most health insurance plans in the state to cover services for trans people, which is like, it just blows my mind. Um, and uh, Illinois is the seventh, seventh state in the country that has a Department of Insurance that has taken this step. And next up is Medicaid. And we're working on Medicaid coverage for trans services, which is essential. Um, and uh, it's all thanks to Governor Quinn and his administration for being willing to take a stand on uh, LGBT uh, services and the rights of trans ind individuals. So that's incredibly exciting. Um, and also Jason Hart, uh, who's with State Rep uh, Rita Mayfield, who is a fierce, fierce, fierce uh, HIV advocate. And Jason is a member of our advocacy group, Illinois Alliance for Sound AIDS Policy, or Illinois ASAP, get it? <laughs> Clever. <laughs> Wish I could say I'd come up with that, but. <laughs> I uh, wish I'd come up with that acronym, but I didn't. So, um, but uh, yeah, I can take credit for it anyway. Uh, so um, I was our state lobbyist in Springfield for um, uh, six years, and I've known John for much of that time, and that's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> no, we've, we've spent a lot of time in Springfield, and you know, six years in Springfield is like, I don't know, 40 in dog years. Yeah. And, oh, cool. and my, I had an exit plan from Springfield, which is really, really important if you're working down there. So I'm very thankful for that. Um, so at AIDS Foundation of Chicago, we really take a social justice approach to HIV and AIDS. Um, HIV is not the problem, it's the symptom of the problem. And so we look at HIV as uh, a problem and a challenge that we can't address without addressing racism, poverty, sexism, disproportionate in incarceration, homophobia, uh, the stigma of HIV, um, and a litany of other challenges that are facing uh, low-income people um, who are at risk of HIV. Uh, there are about 50,000 new HIV infections in the United States every year, about uh, 1,500 every year in 
uh, Illinois and about 1,000 or so in Chicago. The majority of those uh, new cases and of cur uh, people currently living with HIV are people of color, uh, majority gay men and men who have sex with men. The good news is that new HIV cases have actually get, been going down since about 2006. And this is not something that we talk about and celebrate enough, but um, we have seen new cases go down significantly among uh, particularly African-American women, among injection drug users. Uh, the population we have not seen a decline in is gay men and men who have sex with men. And actually there's new evidence, our recent data from Chicago that shows uh, what might be looking like a spike in new HIV cases among gay men and men who have sex with men, uh, which is a tremendous concern. Uh, what we're also seeing is that most new HIV cases are among young men of color. So uh, gay African-American men who have sex with men uh, under the age of 25 is where we're seeing the new cases. And all the research shows that those new cases are really uh, driven by a number of structural factors. And if we don't address those structural factors, we're not going to address, uh, address those new cases. So the research shows that um, young gay black men are not having uh, condomless sex at higher rates than their white or Latino peers. Substance abuse rates are not dramatically different. Uh, the rates of, uh, of sexually transmitted diseases, not dramatically different. What's different is that young gay black men are only having sex with other gay black men. And when the rates of HIV are already so high in that population, there uh, is evidence in some cities, including Chicago, that 50% of uh, African American gay men and men who have sex with men are HIV positive. Um, your risk of uh, becoming infected from one, uh, one time you have condomless sex is so much higher. If you're swimming in the pool with more sharks, you're more likely to get bitten. And that's because of the patterns of uh, dating and sex and the tremendous segregation in Chicago and across uh, the country. And the, we have an incredible opportunity now uh, through the power of antiretroviral medications uh, to have a tremendous impact on the epidemic. And that's because we know now that people who are living with HIV, if they receive treatment, have uh, an reduced, a tremendously reduced risk, up to 96% lower risk of transmitting HIV to their partners in the community if their viral load is suppressed. We know that PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, taking uh, an antiretroviral HIV medication um, has an upwards of 90% chance of preventing new HIV infections. Uh, incredible, incredible evidence that essentially old technology that HIV medications have been around for 18 years now, um, we have an opportunity to harness the power of antiretroviral medications uh, to prevent HIV in a way that we have not known about before. So the question becomes, how are we gonna do that? Well, one, the Affordable Care Act. Thank you, President Obama. Thank you, Governor Quinn. Thank you, uh, Illinois legislature for passing Medicaid expansion. Um, it's just, it gives me chills to think about the fact that today, everyone in Illinois, except for people who are undocumented, have the ability to get the comprehensive health care that they need. Um, and we still have lots of work to do to improve uh, the Affordable Care Act, but the fact that it's there is a tremendous, tremendous advantage. Um, so, okay, where's the public policy connection and where am I going with this? Um, first of all, AIDS Foundation of Chicago is right now um, kicking off our policy priorities development process 
for next year. So we will be doing a series of community uh, meetings and forums to find out what it is that the community wants us to be working on um, over the next two year period. So we'll be announcing those on our website, agechicago.org, and we invite all of you to uh, join us for those. Um, but I will say that one of the things that we will probably, that we are certainly going to be working on is expanded access to prep. Um, and we will be looking at um, a uh, state program, possibly, uh, to make sure that PrEP is widely available to everyone who wants it and needs it. Uh, the state of Washington was the first state to start what they call PrEP-DAP, which is um, PrEP Drug Assistance Program. Uh, and it's... Um, it's pretty self-explanatory, actually. So uh, that's something that, that we're going to be looking into and um, working on uh, here in, in Illinois. Another major issue that we're going to be working on, and I know John is going to be talking about this later, is state budget. Um, we are, first of all, going into an election cycle that presents us with some very stark choices about the state budget. Um, I am very, very, very concerned about what happens in January when the uh, current uh, tax rate is scheduled to be reduced and the great sucking sound of revenue that we're gonna hear at the state level and the impact of, on that on HIV services, on Medicaid access, on all of the uh, programs that we consider to be vital to uh, vulnerable populations. So um, one of our major priorities uh, is going to be uh, uh, continuing that the current tax rates. Um, so that's that's all I'm going to say. Um, I look forward to our conversation, um, and um, I'm going to pass it on to uh, I guess to Morgan. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Can we give <laughs> Thank you. Um, next, we have Audra, who um, has a lot of insight on a number of issues on the federal level. And so we were hoping that you can share some of those main points um, that your office is working on. And then also, um, out of a lot of the issues that we've discussed today, um, are those similar to what you're working on? And do you tackle those differently since it is from a federal lens? Okay, thanks. Um, I'm glad this is a friendly audience because sometimes as we're coming from the federal level and all the acrimony in co you know, Congress and <laughs> you know, President Clinton and make, President, ooh, President Clinton, whoops, President Obama. Real lips to God's ears. Oh my gosh. Hey. <laughs> Hey, look, it's my birthday, so give me a break. So, <laughs> so okay. No. <laughs> but, um, no, but seriously, but with a lot of the stuff that's happening at the federal level, there's a lot of acrimony. There's been a lot of, um, you know, Congresswoman Kelly, for those of you who don't know, uh, came in through a special election um, a little over a year ago. She was uh, sworn in on um, April 11th of 2013, and she replaced um, a former Congressman Jesse Jackson, Jr., in a in an election that has 17 people in the primary, so it was definitely a very interesting ride. But um, she was a state legislator uh, and worked as um, in the South suburbs uh, for several years, including serving with President Obama, and so has lo has a long track record of being very much a supportive of. Um, well, all sorts of very progressive causes, um, supportive of the LGBT community, um, has been a staunch supporter of marriage equality, um, which was a position that we took when we came into office that, that didn't sit too well with some um, segments of our, our constituency that were a little bit older, a little more conservative, a little more religious. Um, so a lot of the things that were happening at the state level, it's interesting, we get these phone calls, like, what does she think? And, at first, I tried to do this. Well, you know, we are federal legislators, but that didn't work. So I said, <laughs> well, I said, well, the truth be told, we are very supportive of marriage equality in Illinois. And while it is, um, we're talking about state law, you know, we still stand behind it. And you know, I'm sure I pissed some people off. So that's fine. Um, but 
There are definitely a lot of things that are happening at the federal level, and I know there are representatives of other legal services organizations in here that can talk about there are a lot of things that happen now with the repeal of DOMA. And situations that we may never have even thought about or encounter as yet. Um, just so you know, my background, because I'm not sure it's in the packet, I am um, a, a public interest lawyer by training. I actually work with several, for several years with the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty Law. So, uh, so my background is sort of food stamps, food security, public benefits. So I've had opportunities to work with um, the AIDS Foundation and other legal service organizations. And so one of the things that I've seen is just that through working with those organizations, you start to see, peel back the layers of when now marriage equality is granted, you know, along with the wonderful perks and benefits of being married, now are some of those nuances that you didn't think about. So issues with, with respect to surrogacy and uh, adoption and all these, these kind of issues that are now starting to rise to the surface that when the law was passed, they may not have been thought of as yet because the circumstance hasn't presented itself. And so that's a lot of what I'm seeing at the federal level. Um, the Congresswoman, I'll show you just some of the bills that are going on. Let me just pull this up for a second. She right now is a co-sponsor of um, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, and I just want to make sure I get the, the number right, which is um, the House co-sponsor, which is um, uh, House Bill 1755. And what that does is basically it prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of actual or perceived sexual orientation or gender identity by employers, employment agencies, labor organizations, um, or joint labor and management committees. Um, there are also another series of kind of bills that are going through in all different aspects. So we're talking about um, fairness in lending with respect to credit. We're talking about veterans issues. It's kind of a whole host of different federal bills that have been introduced, quite frankly, within the last year. Um, and interestingly, even though there's so much gridlock and partisanship, they have had a, a, a decent amount of Republican co-sponsorship. So you'd be kind of pleasantly surprised to know that there is Republican co-sponsorship, primarily because of a point that you made, and that is um, there are some Republicans who do realize how the ties have sort of changed in their districts. And when it comes to discrimination in public accommodations and in, in employment and other situations, there are a lot of folks who aren't willing to take that sort of stand. So the Republican legislators are actually more willing to, um, to actually co-sponsor some of these bills. So interestingly, there is probably more chance of some of these bills actually being passed coming through when Congress is back um, from recess um, this month. Um, so this is some of the things that we are kind of keeping our eye on. And um, the other interesting tidbit, too, is that with respect to, to health issues, especially among the African-American community and gay black males, Congresswoman Kelly actually, um, I'm sort of giving you the inside scoop here, as of January 1st, will be assuming the uh, chairmanship of the, the, the Congressional Black Caucus Brain Trust, so the Health Brain Trust. And so though we have run in a platform a lot, as many of you have heard of gun violence, um, including talking about gun violence as a public health issue, we are now starting to kind of shift our focus a bit into kind of public health realm. And so some of the issues that we were talking about today are some of the very same issues, particularly when we're talking about um, access to for many communities of color and health disparities and inequities among um, uh, African-American populations, particularly the LGBT community. These are some of the issues that we're going to be actually taking on when we uh, assume that chairmanship of the Health Brain Trust. So I will definitely be reaching out to many of you to say, OK, <laughs> now that we've got this sort of platform, what is happening on the ground in Illinois? And obviously, even though CBC is representing the entire country, you know, we are always looking at Illinois in many ways has been a kind of great testing ground. Um, I can tell from my public benefit background and in, in uh, marriage equality and other different um, arenas. We've been sort of kind of the front runners in a lot of things. So we'll be looking very much at what's happening on the ground in Illinois as sort of examples that we can start to use or start to build a platform for there. Um, so that's pretty much all that I can think of. Like I said, the, I know the climate is very tense, but interestingly, these are some of the areas where um, there is possibility for um, bipartisanship. There have been examples of that. Um, Senator Durbin and Senator Kirk have been on the front lines of a lot of these issues and co-sponsoring things. Um, many of the, the actually, and another inside tip too, notwithstanding all you hear in the news about the partisanship, 
in Illinois is a very interesting delegation. They're actually much, they work in collaboration a lot more than you would imagine. So they have lunch together like once a month. They, there's a lot more co-sponsorship of bills um, that really uh, it have a direct impact on the state of Illinois that cross party lines. So there's, there's a lot more possibility for trying, finding that partnership in the Illinois delegation, which in turn we try to kind of spread that example uh, throughout other states. So you should know that notwithstanding what you hear, there are some positive things even at the federal front that are happening in the state. Um, so, like I mentioned before, um, I'm with the Chicago Area Fair Housing Alliance, and so um, with working for fair housing rights, I just want to share the fact that, um, you know, nationally, on a federal level, um, folks who are part of the LGBTQ community, um, sexual orientation, it's not a protected class um, with the Fair Housing Act, and I don't think many folks know that. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that if you are a part of that community and you are discriminated against, there is no protection for you, and that, that is wild, that is alarming. And so um, if you are an advocate of housing in any way, shape, or form, <laughs> and you would like to be a part of um, some sort of effort um, that connects to um, this movement, that is something that I just wanted to throw out there because thankfully if you're a resident of the state of Illinois, it is protected, yay, all right, Illinois. But um, unfortunately there are a number of other states that outweigh those that do have that as a protected class. Um, but on, on a light note, um, <laughs> sorry about that, but um, on a lighter note, I wanted to uh, pass the mic back over to um, John Kolhep because he talked about marriage equality and um, that is a fight that was won. That is something that rarely happens in any movement that we're fighting for, you know? I mean, there's definitely still work um, that needs to happen, you know, and continuing that dialogue for sure, but, you know, just as, as um, a spectator of things that have been happening with that, it's just amazing to see people understand um, the fact that this is a human right, it is a basic right, and folks that you would never expect to be a part of this, um, understanding that. And so I was hoping that you can talk about um, some advice, I guess, for others that are in their movements and um, what they can do to get folks on the other side to listen and to be on board. And maybe there, I mean, there are still folks that don't listen, that don't agree with it, but how do you pass um, you know, such an issue that initially we didn't expect to happen when it did? Um, so the first thing I'd like to say is that um, even though DOMA has been struck down and that's great, uh, each state needs to pass marriage equality or the courts need to strike it down because there are a variety of federal issues that, deter that are determined based on state marriage laws. One very basic one is here in the state of Illinois. Um, Jim Darby and Patrick Bova, who've been at the White House, who've been on stage with Governor Quinn, uh, they've been together for 50 years. Uh, Jim is a veteran and they wanted to be, uh, one, married before they died, and two, uh, they wanted to be buried next to each other in a veteran cemetery. Mm -hmm. And if they were just in a civil union, they would not have had that right. It, it, now that they are married officially and are considered married by federal law, I mean state law, which now transfers over to federal law, this is one of the hundreds of benefits that you get from marriage that are based on the state definition of whether or not you're married. So that's why it's important to carry on the fight in all of these other states because of those, those benefits that come from the state definition of marriage. Um, can you really quick uh, go take a step back and for those that don't know the difference between um, civil union and you know, marriage, can you define that for us really quick? Wow. Hey, uh, people don't know. Um, do you want to take that? Some folks no. don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, a civil union basically gives uh, people the right in a state uh, to have many of the state rights that come with marriage, but it's separate and unequal. Mm. Yeah. So you weren't able to have the federal rights 
um, and you weren't able to um, basically have the same rights as the person who lived next door to you? I'm sure there's a better answer than that, but separate and unequal is pretty good. Oh, when you so when you mentioned about um, the importance with states, and I'm glad that you raised that point. But just to give you an example of sort of what's happening at the federal level and how it parallels what's happening at the state level. So when you talked about veteran spouses, there was a bill that was just introduced a month ago, a month and a half ago, called the Veteran Spouses Equal Treatment Act, and specifically it would provide family benefits to lawfully married lesbian and gay veterans as are already provided to veterans with different sex spouses, regardless of where, the, where they live. The, the catch, however, is that the definition of spouse is contingent upon the definition of spouse in the state. So for every state that now defines a spouse, you know, um, you know, irrespective of, of gender, then that's a positive thing. But for those that still have not initiated marriage equality, then this would not be applicable. So that's one of the reasons why you know, the state is definitely mirroring what's happening. If the federal government is mirroring what's happening at state level, but why it is still important for that state advocacy to continue, because there's only so much we can do until each state actually goes so far as to repeal whatever discriminatory laws that it has in the books. So uh, you asked about winning and how do we win. Um, and I, I, I want to talk about the power of coalitions. Uh, and we do nothing at the AIDS Foundation of Chicago on our own. Um, and we have found, particularly in our work at, in Springfield, that the, the most powerful work that we're able to get done is often in coalitions. And most importantly, when we get really broad, really diverse coalitions. Um, and when we are able to bring experts to the table and we're able to bring people who have relationships that we don't have to the table, that's when we win. And an example of that is we got the State Medical Society to uh, sign on to something we were working on. And they happen to be uh, very well respected in uh, Republican quarters. Uh, and we, they were able, their lobbyists were able to access people that we weren't with a credibility that we don't have because you know, we're not doctors and um, we don't wear white coats and, um, and we don't give them a lot of money too. So, or any actually. Um, so uh, just the, the, the power of coalitions is critical to our work. And um, uh, we don't, you know, we don't have the ability to turn out 70,000 phone calls, emails and people, um, but we do have the power to bring coalitions to the table. And on winning uh, with that, I will say that there are many organizations that are in this room that were partners on marriage equality. Um, and when we kicked off that effort, I think I came on board on the 15th. Our uh, plan was approved by the 22nd, and we took it to our partners on the 28th. Uh, it was very important that all of our partners bought in, because uh, there were over 70 of them. Uh, and Many of you in this room made phone calls to people, sent emails, uh, and it was that action through our coalition that, uh, that won. Um, now, John also mentioned uh, another coalition, but uh, we were both part of the Responsible Budget Coalition, uh, which was responsible for the uh, increase in the income tax four years ago. And that, uh, that coalition could not have passed uh, the income tax increase had it not come together in the very broad way it did, uh, both with legislators and, uh, what, 500 organizations at the table um, pushing for uh, the increase in the income tax. It was a massive coalition, and holding it together was a second job. Um, and uh, the Sh Shriver Center, uh, John Bowman was our chairman, and uh, we'll, we will all uh, forever be grateful to him for taking on that responsibility. Um, but it is through broadening your base. Um, and on marriage, two of the things that we did very intentionally were, once I came on board, we um, broadened our base uh, in the Republican communities, and we broadened our base in urban African-American and Latino communities, two areas that had been left aside uh, during the uh, fight in the spring. 
And without those two communities, three communities, we would not have been able to garner the support we did from uh, those legislators to pass the bill. Thank you. Um, there were a couple of hands that went up in the audience. Yeah, sorry, I had a question on federal agencies. Um, when you say times, and I, I, I'm not sure I understand what this means. Um, Oh, yeah, but it's not for amplification. Oh, it's for right. gotcha. <laughs> okay. Hello. Um, yeah. Hi. So um, my question concerns federal agencies. I spoke this morning to the Department of Justice, um, to Grand Lum, who is the director of the uh, C CRS, Service of the Department of Justice Community Relations. Um, and I was talking a lot about trans issues because they have just rolled out trans training for Department of Justice to take to police precincts um, all across the country. And it's very unique training. Um, it's very groundbreaking training. But unfortunately, it seems to be very reactive rather than proactive training. For example, I said to you know Director Lum, I said, so obviously you're all over Ohio right now, where you've had four trans women of color who've been murdered since, since June of 2013. He goes, oh, oh, no, 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 no not really. Um, but now we will be. Um, and I said, so, so, so what's, what's going on? I mean, and he said, well, we need people to be proactively coming to us and letting us know and, and where we need to be and this, that, and the other. And I said also inter interdepartmentally, um, interagency rather. So, you know, while you're rolling out this, Immigration's Customs Enforcement is a bloody mess. It's an absolute disaster. You've got trans people being misgendered, abused in prisons. I'd been to one of those prisons to see for myself. And while they were on their best behavior for me, I could sort of see what, you know, you know that th there's, there's a disconnect between what I'm hearing and what they're trying to show me. And there's a disconnect between ICE's agencies, uh, I different people in ICE who are saying, yes, we're doing something, no, we're not, yes, we, yes. We. So it seems like these agencies are in quite a quandary, and the DOG, DOJ is trying to take a lead, but it's not happening otherwise. So when we talk about coalitions, how are we how are we as a coalition to try and get these federal agencies on board to stop discrimination? Um, I'm not just talking about trans issues, but LGBT, when we talk about ICE, you know, ICE agencies, we know that you're talking about the spectrum. But trans issues in, in particular, um, not only that, but in State Department of Corrections. So I know it's a big, broad question, but I'd be very interested. I wish I had a, a better answer for you. The fact is, for all the steps that have been taken by, by federal agencies and, and legislators, the, the proactivity, quite frankly, is happening. It's what's happening on the ground. This is not a proactive body you know, in, in many ways. Um, one problem that you're talking about is that lack of coordination. So while you might have one kind of agency or department that's e even trying to be more forward thinking, there's not necessarily a mechanism in place to make sure that it is collaborating or working you know, working collaboratively with other agencies. That's kind of a, also a problem with, that I see oftentimes even in, in the law, um, as, as laws and legislation changes, that sometimes it's, it's, it is reactive and it oftentimes doesn't, it's not done in such a way that people are sort of thinking forward that, okay, if this is repealed or if this is changed, what are sort of the residual impacts? And so that's why I would tell you as, you know, heading a, an office uh, for a member of Congress, we reach out a lot to the community to find out what's happening on the ground, including what are some of the things that are bubbling up? You know, so things that have not necessarily come to the surface, but what you anticipate is going to be that next place for us to be um, an advocate. So at least from member offices, we can start to think a bit more proactively. But unfortunately, what you're talking about is a much broader scale need to be uh, to be thinking more proactively instead of reactively. I would say baby steps, because for a lot of these agencies, there was, there was no reaction. So the mere fact that there is at least some sort of push to be reactive is a positive thing. The other thing, quite frankly, is, is politics. The, the negative side of politics is what you see, the partisanship and the gridlock. But what I've found, and I've been working in politics now for over 10 years, is that um, Sometimes when you play to people's fears of not getting an office, you, you, if you get them at just the right moment, as these gentlemen kind of talk about, that's kind of the way that you can start to get them to sing their tunes and to be more proactive. Some of the things that I know advocates are doing on the ground, quite frankly, is really talking about public sentiment 
and sort of bypassing what's happening in Congress and what's happening in agencies and really going directly to the people to say your positions are quite frankly completely contrary to that of you know, your constituents. Now I'm coming from a, a realm of working with low income working families and I taught for several years at Northwestern Law, and one of the things that I would ask, for example, is why do poor white people vote Republican? And, and I'd say, you know, people are like, what? And I'm like, no, seriously, what, why? You know, you know you're not, you know, you, you're talking about how proud that I don't take government largesse, this, that, and the other, but you're also working three jobs and have no health insurance and all these other this, ills. People, you know, oftentimes would fall for sort of the, the okie with the party rhetoric, the whatever, but what's been happening right now, especially as a consequence of the recession and the sort of prolonged economic downturn, is that people are starting to realize, like, wait a minute, <laughs> notwithstanding what's happening with the Tea Party and all these other things, I'm still struggling, and I'm finding myself in a similar boat as a lot of other people, and too many college graduates are coming out and are working as baristas at Starbucks, mm -hmm. at best, you know? so. I say that to say that that is actually the time that I think for advocates to really jump on the fact and, and find those coalitions to say, hey, listen, whether you're Republican or you're Democrat, there are just some things that are happening right now that are affecting all of us equally. And we need to be coalescing around that. And there are many politicians who are actually reacting to that, which is why in Illinois you have Republicans who are jumping onto a marriage equality bill, which is why you have a Republican senator and Mark Kirk, who has actually, quite frankly, signed on to a, quite a few of these sorts of bills. So it's a very slow process, but I, I don't want people to think n nothing is happening. So we are reactive, but again, it went from no reaction to at least trying to react, and hopefully we'll be able to push the needle to actually being proactive. Yeah. I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> um, let me grab it and I'll come back. So my, my question is for John at the um, AIDS uh, Foundation Chicago, and I want to put it in the context of a win. And you talked about coalitions. But I'm a little concerned about the um, AIDS Foundation of Chicago because um, the high rates of HIV tr uh, transmission among black women is my passion. And so when I was working with Affinity, um, you all weren't there a lot for us in the black community. We have identified um, not only are our young black men having sex um, within MSM, but they are also having sex with men who determine that, you know, they say they're gay, and I know that you have identified them, but to me, and I know you're new at your role, uh, AIDS Foundation of Chicago really does not pull back the layers. One of the things that I'm concerned about is that the Chicago um, Public Health Department has um, an event maybe twice a year where they pass out condoms, and the only station that they are located at is 63rd and Woodlawn, or whatever, wherever the tr green line stops, but no one thought about 43rd and Calumet, or 51st and uh, Cottage Grove. Um, the disease has not left our community, and it, to me, it seems as if White Advocacy Chicago stays primarily on the north side. And until there is dollars on the table, big dollars on the table, do they then reach out to organizations like Affinity, not giving Affinity um, such a lead role, not that we don't, ha we, didn't, we don't have the capacity and we didn't have the capacity then, we definitely don't have the capacity now. But it would always give an opportunity to either maybe employ some people. I mean, there are millions of dollars that go to the center on Halstead, where our organizations are asked to come and join and build the coalition, and we're given a piece of the pie. But there's always enough money to employ someone, say like myself, even though I'm not here in Chicago any longer, to be an advocate to the people that are in my community. There are definite organizations that need to be touched, like churches, you know, Urban League, NAACP, and I, and I know I got to roll up. But I know for a fact that the CDC gave these historical black organizations who will vote and have voted against marriage equality, don't stand with marriage equality, 
but have been given millions of dollars to roll out some kind of education uh, platform and did nothing because the race of HIV AIDS is still rising in our community. And so I wanna know what commitment will um, AIDS Foundation Chicago make to the black community who is literally suffering and, and in suffrage. And we know what these children need. We know what our, what, what's happening to our young black men and our young black women in our community, but yet we're really not given a platform to help ourselves. How can we coalesce and, co and, and build a coalition so that we can really begin to bring down these rates of, of, of HIV? It, it, Michelle, uh, is your name is Michelle, yes, right? Sir. Thank you for your comments. I really, really appreciate them, and um, I, I hear what you are saying. Our biggest priority at the AIDS Foundation of Chicago and among the agencies that, uh, that we collaborate with um, is, uh, is serving people of color and reducing the rates of HIV among people of color. Can we do, be doing more? Yes. Can we do, be doing it better? Absolutely. And I um, would love to get your thoughts on concrete ways that we could improve the ways that we work uh, with the African American community and the way we reach young gay black men of color. Um, I can give you a litany of ways that we are uh, working with the African American community, um, but I won't do that. What I will say is that I am deeply, deeply concerned about the lack of capacity among African American community-based organizations to serve the population. And um, Southside Help Center is an example of that. They you know, almost went under this year, and um, we've been working with them very closely to try and find um, ways that their work can become more sustainable. Um, it, the, you know, we, we just saw the state um, unable to fund uh, programs that had applied for the African American HIV AIDS Response Act funding, and that was because of a uh, technical mistake in a budget appropriations bill that the state made. And um, one of our top advocacy priorities uh, going into next legislative session and working with the governor's office and the De Department of Public Health is to make sure that uh, African American HIV AIDS response funds um, are going to be targeted to the, to the agencies that can do uh, the work. But you know, one of the challenges that we see is that there's HIV prevention money that's set aside for uh, agencies in communities of color. And every year, money is left on the table because organizations can't write good enough grants to get the money. And that is heartbreaking to me. <laughs> and I don't, I mean, you know, I, I don't know what we can do to change that. So that is a problem that we all have to address as a community to make sure that agencies of color have the capacity that they need to do the work in their communities. But I also don't want to say that the work, that the, the onus is only on uh, small agencies and communities of color to you know make sure that they have the funding that they need. The onus is on all of us in all of our work and all of our agencies to make sure that the capacity is there and to make sure that we're prioritizing the populations, that we're working to build capacity and being uh, culturally uh, competent and um, that, uh, that the populations that are of greatest concern are part of our organizations, so. So I had one thing before I asked a question. Um, I just wanted to raise up some of the African American organizations that worked with us on marriage quality because there are some uh, like the Chicago Urban League and Affinity, the Chicago Black Gay Men's Caucus and over 100 ministers, 14 out of 20 African American members of the House and all but one African American senator all were with us on marriage equality. 
There were members who took very strong stands, including op-eds in their home papers, um, and speaking to their congregations, and in uh, and educating congregations, and educating communities. It was a really wonderful effort from uh, the African American, not just gay community, but the African American community in support of marriage equality. And while there were some folks that opposed us in the community, there were so many people that were with us that I just wanted to raise them up uh, during this conversation. But I did have a question too. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Gaylon, uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, so there's a question on the ballot this year about access to birth control. Um, and are you working on that? Is, uh, do you know about that? I, I know very little. In all honesty, I don't know a lot. I know that uh, Representative um, Kelly Cassidy um, introduced that and is working on that. However, she did use we, one of the things that we've been doing is going out and meeting with our legislators to talk about and educate them on the reproductive justice framework. And so, of course, affordable, safe birth control is included in that. And we went and we talked to Representative Kelly, who's always been supportive, but she did use um, a lot of the language of RJ, reproductive justice, um, in thinking about that and framing that conversation to her colleagues. Um, I am not going to try to say I know so much that's going on because I don't I don't know um, exactly what that is looking like right now. Um, but I would be more than happy to um, have another conversation with you um, once I do have some more information. Um, I actually wanted to go back to the question about winning um, because. It's really easy if you are younger than me, or Kim, or some of the other people who are old enough to remember when <laughs> these things were, ha I mean, this is really serious. It's easy to imagine that there was domestic partnership, and then there was civil unions, and then five minutes later was marriage equality. But the important thing, and it's important in building coalitions, and Galen can speak to this about reproductive justice and abortion rights also, this has been going on for 40 years. It didn't start this century. You build coalitions, sometimes over decades. The Chicago Urban League didn't just wake up one day out of nowhere and say, marriage equality, cool. You know, there were years and years and years of work and more work that still has to be done. You can't just say, let's have coalitions and we'll get everybody in a room and then we'll all vote the same way or we'll all, you know, get legislation passed or we'll all advocate for the same thing. It's decades of hard work and I think sometimes you see something happen, especially the, the short time between civil unions and marriage passing in Illinois. It's very easy to think that there's kind of momentum that's inevitable and you get to this point and then things just go forward until you get the win. But I can't, I, other people in the room can do the same thing. I can't even begin to make a list of what has changed in the 40 years since people started advocating for marriage equality. And I'm not even an advocate of marriage equality and I still can look back and see thousands of small steps that led to this. And if you don't recognize that it takes thousands of steps, you, nothing changes. You can't just wake up one day and say, oh yeah, support for AIDS healthcare in the African American community, let's just go do that. You know, you ha you, it's, it's hard, hard work. And the people who do that hard work do it understanding that lots of people came before them doing it. And lots of people are going to come after them still doing it because just passing marriage equality doesn't solve even the problems for people who are, want to be married. So that's all. Laura Stemple. Thank you. Yeah, my name is what? Sorry. Oh. Jason, you're next. <laughs> uh, my name is Damon Hainline, and I, I think in a conference about intersections, um, we, we have a really good opportunity to address how we work as coalitions and how policy is formed. Uh, I, I was at a conf or a public discussion about a month ago about how the immigration movement can learn lessons from the marriage equality movement. And one of the things that came out of that was the 
LGBT policy successes over the past several years have been because it wasn't a comprehensive bill where we got everything all at once. We did things little by little. And with the immigration discussion, what came out of it was we should break apart immigration into smaller things and pass immigration little by little. And in that past month, what I have heard is that LGBT issues within the immigration policy is one of the things that is going to be considered later because it would be easier to pass immigration forward. And I think that we see that line of like, where are our coalition members at the table changing a lot right now? We see it with INDA with the recent Hobby Lobby case. We've seen it with INDA before when they uh, tried to pass it without including trans folks. I, I think that we're at this place of discussion about how do coalitions work together and continue to represent ourselves and fight for the things that we want within policy and how do we deal with it when these things seem to be the things that are being removed from the policy that we want. So uh, I'm just going to say one thing and give my head back. So uh, the, first, um, the first major article that the AP wrote about the marriage quality campaign in the summer was that we were looking to the immigrant rights movement and to the union movement uh, for their lessons <laughs> to pass marriage equality. Um, and it, you know, I worked on immigration issues in 2004. I definitely learned so much from the community organizing that the immigration community and the immigration movement taught me to bring to the marriage equality campaign. I don't believe we would have had some of the success we did had we not had that history. I just, this is pretty much a statement. I just want to say, Rita Mayfield, as you all know, did not vote on the bills, on the marriage equality bill. Um, I'm Jason Hart. I work with State Representative Rita Mayfield. She did not vote for um, e marriage equality bill. Yeah. But I let but I let you know right now. She is cha She had eighty percent of her people in Waukegan vote against equality. Her family was for. I was for as bisexual myself. I was for, and I told her and she was on edge. So no excuse for it, she didn't vote for it, but she is doing some changes. She is starting, uh, she is going to do, she's starting a LGBT support group, the first ever in, her, in Lake County. The first ever in Lake County she is working on. So I want to thank you so much for your efforts. Um, you made a big change in the fight of equality and you have open Rita's eyes pretty much and she's making positive change in her area. She is also sent with the HIV thing, she just sent um, in April 60 people from her area to Springfield to advocate on HIV issues. So I just want to say thank you so much. Can you pass the mic actually over? Yeah. Um, I, I apologize, I have to head back to the office, um, but I just wanted on to let- birthday? On my birthday? On my birthday, I was just <laughs> telling you, man. Um, but, uh, um, but Kim, you have my information too, so um, we represent, uh, obviously, uh, UFC is in the second congressional district. Um, Kim has all my information, so I'm more than happy to come out and talk and just listen so, and, and just share information. Um, and just one point that you made when you're talking about the coalitions, I, I would just add, and I've seen this in the ground now that I have a kind of insider and outsider perspective. Coalitions are great, but you always have to sort of respect the kind of sensitivities of the groups that are coalescing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes some coalitions don't work that well because we sort of focus on the things that keep us apart as opposed to those commonalities. And this is a very peculiar thing when it comes to politics and you hear the whole expression about strange bedfellows. So sometimes when I tell advocacy groups when they're coming to the congresswoman with issues and I said, you know, you need to find those places of common ground and focus exclusively on them and respect the fact that we will diverge in opinions in certain places. A perfect example of that, obviously, when we were talking about Prop 8 in California and the whole debate with African-American communities saying, well, how could you say this? How could you say that? And I worked on um, President Obama's, I was a senior staffer for his US Senate campaign. And it was interesting because we had black ministers who would come out and say, don't vote for Barack because he's for gay marriage. 
And my opinion was like, look, someone just got shot through the window sitting eating their breakfast. So, and I'm, this is an oops. But I don't care if Bob and Steve want to get married because someone just got shot, you know. And, and 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 that was sort of the attitude that we had. That we said, you're not prioritizing sort of what the issues are in communities. We may diverge in certain issues, but you need to sort of find where is that common ground. So I just say that, especially now when we're talking about advocacy for marriage equality, and among the African American community, there's a lot of those sensitivities. But when we found is when we talked about issues in terms of kind of human rights and the right, for example, to make decisions with health care and other things things, it's interesting because people will say, well, of course people should be able to make those decisions, and of course people should be able to do this. So you start finding that if you sometimes remove certain language, but you talk about what's at the root, you'll get a lot more traction. So it's just something to be mindful of when we're talking about creating those sorts of coalitions and being mindful of the fact that we will diverge in some places, but there are many more places where there are commonalities than differences, and don't get too hung up on the places where we diverge. So. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we also give Audra a round of applause really quick? Thank you for being here. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Um, really quick, I'm going to pass the mic back to um, Galen. She wanted to answer um, John's question. I want to go back to that. So I went back in my email because I get a million emails. And so I'm like trying to. <laughs> It is there. So um, it's House Bill 5755 that you're um, asking about that's going to be on the ballot November 4th. And it's called the Women's Health Referendum um, Act. And basically what it's going to do is ask the voters, should birth control be included in their health care coverage? Yeah. And uh, yeah. that's coming from all the, the media storm around the Holly Lobby case and other um, religious organizations or companies that are denying women birth control coverage based on their be religious beliefs. And yeah. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Donald, did you want to? Oh, yeah. um, <clears throat> I, I hope that I'm not violating, first of all, uh, socially the, the role of host <laughs> by participating at this point, but I'd like to switch from being the, the national me to being the local me. You know, I'm a native-born Chicagoan. Uh, I will be turning 65 tomorrow. And so 40 years ago, I received a double birthday present with not only Nixon leaving office, but, <laughs> <laughs> but with Lincoln Mall opening in Madison, Illinois. So I was delighted that day. But, uh, but I'm also, I'm sitting here and, and I listen to the, the different offices and organizations and institutions that are related here and, and you are all part of my biography. I'm a former staff member uh, at the University of Illinois at Chicago, uh, Governor State, uh, former Dean of Students at Joliet Junior College, uh, Assistant Dean of Students at uh, uh, IIT, but I'm also a former staff member at Howard Brown Health Center and um, professionally, my HIV AIDS work dates back to Stop AIDS Chicago. That's the first place I was on, state, on, on staff. And I was part of that first group of, of higher ed educators in the state of Illinois that were charged with uh, HIV um, uh, outreach programs on, on the state colleges and university campuses. But um, I'm also a constituent of Congresswoman Kelly, and I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to share before, and a constituent of, of Illinois Representative Will Davis, who voted, by the way, in favor. Uh, but as his constituent, you know, I went to his office and we spent a lot of time <laughs> running right around uh, on, on, on that issue. But as a lifelong South Sider, mm. I, uh, I, I was born here at Michael Reese Hospital, lived in the city until I was 10 years old in the shadow of the University of Chicago. Uh, but then uh, for the last 50 years, I've lived in Harvey, Illinois. Mm. And my suggestion to, to my colleagues here from whatever organization you're in, when you're looking at issues concerning the black community, um, think not only in terms 
of, of race, but also think in terms of class. In the center of poor South Side black Chicago mm -hmm. is no longer within geographical Chicago. If you want to get to the center of where young gay black men are passing along HIV, mm -hmm. if you want to get to the center of where interaction between uh, black MSMs are happening, you know, it's not on 63rd Street. It's not even on 95th Street anymore. You know, come to 154th, you know, and Park Avenue. Come to the Pace Bus turnaround there. You know, come to the Metro Electric Station there. That's where it's happening. And I share this not uh, um, in opposition to you, but because I've worked with all of these organizations, and I've been saying this for years, hey, it's out here. Remember that we sit not one mile away from where the most densely populated strip of land on the face of the earth once existed with the Robert Taylor Homes and the Stateway Gardens Homes, okay? And we saw those go away, and the promise when they went away was that there would be replacement housing built for those people. Well, it never was. And where did it come? It came to those of us who were working class and poor African American people already living in the South suburbs. You know? And there's a continuing conversation that goes on in our community that doesn't really recognize the geographical line separating the city of Chicago from the South suburbs. You know? You, you know Think about Thornton Township, which is still the most populated township in suburban Cook County. And it is now almost all black, okay? And that's where those people went to, you see. And so we've got to consider class, we've got to consider race, but we've also got to consider geography. Now, I can tell you from my, my, my days at at Stop AIDS and at Howard Brown, um, and as a member, and, and as a, a gay man myself, you know, the debate of, of how much uh, happens on the north side and in Boys Town versus what happens to those out there in the rest of the world, that, that debate still goes on. Um, but my suggestion is let's include geography in our considerations if we're talking about outreach and what goes on. Because I even happen to be the only guy who staffed the, the Taft Street office in South Holland um, for the, uh, un, um, the Illinois Unites for Marriage Equality effort. So, you know, it's, it's lonely out there and it's a long trek to the north side. You know, but we need you out there because that's where the center of what's happening and impacting all of these agencies is. Thank you. Um, I wanted to share a little personal story that I thought of while you were talking. Um, I had friends in town in Chicago and we went on a tour of downtown. And so the company, I won't say their name, but they gave us a map of the city of Chicago to go away with. And when I look at the map, it did not extend beyond IIT, beyond 35th Street. And so I'm just like, oh, that's interesting. Because I last time I checked, I thought Chicago went into the hundreds. I guess not. And so, you know, it's just, I think that I completely agree with everything that you said, because on nearly every level, there is quite the disconnect, whether it be extending public transit appropriately um, to that part of Chicago, whether it be people just even acknowledging that it exists. And so um, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know how much time we have left. OK. <laughs> so I'm, OK. <laughs> You get to have the last word. Um, so I am going to take the, the hostess privilege here and go back to Jason and some of the things that he just shared with us. So um, Jason from Rita Mayfield's office, I want to be clear about that. One of the reasons Affinity wanted to do something like at, at the intersections is because what 
our experience was through the marriage equality fight was that we were not seeing enough um, discussion with black legislators. And not just from, um, um, you know, the typical sort of white gay man who goes uh, to talk to Springfield, and I don't say that disparagingly at all, um, but I think it's very important for folks who represent certain communities to show the full diversity of those communities, and that's two-sided. So our organizations, those organizations that serve queer and trans people of color, also have to step up and be engaged in discussions with the uh, representatives at the state and federal and city level that represent us in um, government. So what we have wanted to do with this event is to begin to work much more closely with the members of the Black Legislative Caucus at the state level in particular, because we came to a clear understanding um, during the marriage equality fight because we had more of a concerted effort working with legislators that we had a lot of relationship building to do as an organization. So I don't wanna dismiss what Jason just shared with us, that someone like Rita <coughs> Mayfield sent someone here, not to spy, but to actually <laughs> be a part of this discussion and for Jason to share what he just sa shared is huge. So I just wanted to put that back in the room uh, to make sure that that didn't get ignored. Uh, this question's for John at the AIDS Foundation. You talked about how um, biomedical prevention, so PrEP and treatment as prevention, has really revolutionized prevention um, for people who are in the know, people who have a sex positive healthcare provider, people who are going to talk about their sexual practices. Um, you also talked about expanding coverage for PrEP so that financially it's more accessible. Um, but what do you see as the barriers to making it culturally more accessible so that people know about it, people feel safe discussing it with their doctor, their doctors know about it? Um, what do you see as sort of the next step to get beyond just revolutionizing things for people who are in the know. Um, and that group has been putting together uh, a, um, a, a plan, essentially, a proposal to address the issues that you raise. So part of the, the idea is to create a network of 20 essentially prep clinics around the city of Chicago, um, and particularly on the south and west sides and on the south suburbs, uh, where there are providers who are knowledgeable about PrEP, who are uh, willing to prescribe PrEP, and who are welcoming to people who want PrEP. Um, there would be a social media campaign uh, to raise awareness and acceptability among uh, among priority populations um, about PrEP. Um, we, PrEP is out there, we know it's there, but the people who need it don't know that it's there. Um, and providers have no idea what it is and they don't understand it. And so that's the barrier that we need to overcome. Um, and this coalition is um, incredible, really. I mean, the, the people that have come together around the, that table are, um, are an incredible group, and if anybody can get it done, they can. So thank you for asking that question. Well, um, we are meeting in the closing of this um, public policy roundtable. Um, I would like to have everyone give a round of applause again for our really fearless panel. Thank you all for being here today.